Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the talk this afternoon, Art Market Trends, um, or as my American counterpart uh, calls it, uh, Car Stars, Ming and Bling. And uh, uh, I thought I'd just start by talking a little bit about who or what drives market trends. Is it collectors, dealers, uh, or auctioneers? Um, Looking back to the 20th century, you can look back right at the beginning, Rockefeller, Guggenheim in the middle of the century, to Sartre at the end of the century, they all had one thing in common. They uh, were ahead of the game, and they had uh, the money, uh, lack of time, I guess, uh, and the drive and the good eye to be buying and, in a way, starting trends. And um, Sartre is a great example in that he really did set his own path in the early 90s by buying the young British artists. Uh, and very cleverly uh, selling at an early period, which really sort of set the trend and, uh, for contemporary art that we see now. And I think that's an important point, that historically trends are only set when the great collectors sell. Now, I think in the last 10 years or so, we're living through a, sort of a different period perhaps, with muddier waters to, to see what's going to happen. Um, according to TFAF for the Maastricht report, the art market globally is worth 51 billion euros. And that's a figure, they, they put, put this report out each year, um, at 7% up on the previous year, uh, and the highest ever total for the art market. 96 lots sold at, at auction at over 10 million pounds or more last year. So there's a situation, isn't there, with quantitative easing, a uh, uh, polite way of putting uh, putting printing money, um, low interest rates, and some ultra-high net worth clients who want to spend money on art like never before. Um, and we have auctioneers, certain auctioneers, joining dealers to sort of occupy that sort of same ground, uh, which is presenting, in, in some cases, funding the next trends. Um, what is clear that with all the trends I'm going to talk about tonight, that whether you're, you're collecting you know, Wedgwood or Warhol, um, connoisseurship still counts. And um, collectors are always in search of a masterpiece, whatever they're collecting. Um, and rarity, condition, uh, and provenance all come together to make, that, to, to make that happen. Value kind of follows from that. Um, I put an example up here of uh, a very famous image, Madonna, uh, by Edvard Munch. Um, both of these are first state etchings. They both date from 1895. Uh, they were both sold in 2010, both as you know, rare as hen's teeth. Um, the one on the left was sold at Bonhams for 1.25 million, uh, and the one on the right was sold in an Oslo auction house for 400,000 pounds. The reason, uh, the Bonhams example, I like, obviously, I like to think obviously that Bonhams did a very good job on it, but of course the, the, the reason really is uh, that it was hand painted by Edvard Munch rather than the, the other one. It's a, it's a complete, has a complete uh, uh, surround on it as well. Uh, and crucially, uh, the vendor, uh, its grandfather, uh, had bought it from Ed, Edvard Munch. So, we had all the elements to make that, that, that sell for, for a world record price. Um, the second part really is condition. Um, and again, I have on, on the screen here two completely contrasting images. Uh, but the first one, the Chinese uh, Qing Dynasty vase that uh, Colin sold for nine million pounds in 2010, was it Colin? 2011. Um, what we learn from, from, from Chinese collectors is, is when they're looking at a, at a magnificent item like this, they're not looking at what's right about it, they're looking for its faults, because any crack or blemish or, or nick in it, it will, will kill the value for them. Uh, and that is true, actually, of the contemporary market as well. The picture here is by an artist called Glenn Brown, a contemporary British painter. It's called Little Death, and we sold it uh, again a couple of years ago for, I think, about £600,000. And he's an interesting artist because he builds layer upon layer of varnish. And if there's any scratch or nick on that, it, kill, it kills it. And um, looking at his auction records, he's, he's a well-established artist, but a quarter of his work selling over £100,000 haven't sold, which is quite a high attrition rate. It may be pricing, but it may also be condition. But it shows, I think that whatever sector, and particularly contemporary, 
that connoisseurship is alive and kicking is, and is highly important in this market. The other curveball, and I think Gregor's going to allude to this, is, is timing. And uh, I have, uh, I'm just going to just mention this. Um, it doesn't always affect the art market. And certain at the top end of the art market can be bulletproof. It can survive wars and recessions and prices carry on on, on a steady path upwards. But uh, recently we've seen, unfortunately, in the Russian market, it's been hugely affected by the economic sanctions at the end of last year. Uh, and all the, the big three auction houses were affected in our November sales at the end of last year. This is a, a, one of the major uh, Russian artists, a guy called Nik Nikolai Rurik, uh, which the picture on the, on the left, called Madonna Laboris, we sold for £7.8 million, pounds, a world record price, only in 2013. Just over a year later, last November, we offered another one of his major works. Again, may possibly, possibly have made that sort of price, but unfortunately it went unsold, as did a couple of other his works throughout the various auction houses. It just shows what can happen. Um, I'm going to now look at, I picked out a few, uh, in the time allowed, a few, a few uh, of the, the current trends that, that we see from the bottoms auction perspective. Um, and the first big one, of course, is post-war and contemporary. Um, of that 51 billion euro pot in, 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 in art last year, uh, TFAF Maastricht reckon about half of it has gone into <coughs> post-war and contem contemporary art. And the leading contemporary painter at auction is Gerhard Richter. And we sold one of his works, this is one of his works we sold last year, uh, and uh, he is uh, by far and away the biggest name. Um, of his works, I think the highest price is 30 million, and since 2011, uh, 23 works have been sold at auction over 10 million pounds. Um, last year, he grossed 254 million pounds at auction. Um, the artist himself is, is, is sort of embarrassed about it. I'm sure he doesn't really mind, but um, it's an extraordinary situation uh, in the history of, of the art market to see contemporary art, uh, artists making that kind of, of money. Um, the artist on on the left here, Anish Kapoor, uh, is probably one of the, obviously, as everyone knows, one of the leading British contemporary artists who looks posi you know, positively cheap, a real bargain compared to, uh, to Richter. Um, obviously, he's halfway through his career. Richter is in his 70s now, I guess. Um, but I guess we might well see a spike in, in prices that have already gone up for, for, um, for Kapoor uh, over the last 10, 20 years already. But he's an artist that maybe gets to about the five million mark and then stops. Um, back to my car stars, Ming and Bling slide. Um, cars, although obviously not so much part of the art market, uh, are a major part of our business here at Bonhams. And um, Knight Frank put out a luxury wealth index every year. Uh, and they say that the car market has gone up 500% in the last decade. That outstrips all other uh, art markets. Um, Bonhams have set the world record, as I'm sure you know, twice in the last couple of years. And this uh, part, of, part of the car you can see there is a, is a Ferrari 250 GTO, which we sold for £22 million. What's interesting about the car market is that the big marks are all rising in price, the Bugattis, the Aston Martins, the Ferraris, and so on. But also, at the, what I call the middle market, the sort of £10,000 to £100,000 level, um, there is huge interest, and the latest trends at, uh, at that level are things like cars from the, sort of the, the, the mid to late 80s, the, the Ferraris and Porsches that have tripled in value in, the, in our auctions in the last three years alone. It's an extraordinary period. Uh, and as Mike might talk about, there's, obviously there's no capital gains on cars uh, as they are wasting assets. So uh, people uh, like to invest in for, for that reason as well, I think. Um, I might pass on stars because that's a whole other subject, but it's about sort of theme sales. But I'll come back to that another day. Um, I will, of course, talk about uh, the Chinese market, which for me, uh, I think, over my career, has been the most extraordinary story of all. Um, you know, obviously, we have the most ancient artistic culture in the world, and we have this enormous expansion over the last 20 years, uh, what economic, uh, economic explosion. Um, and we have seen, certainly in the West, the repatriation to China of 
uh, imperial period, uh, jades, bronzes, and ceramics. Um, everyone always, always associates uh, you know, China, the greatest Chinese art with the Ming Dynasty. Well, actually, this vase is, is Qing Dynasty. It dates to sort of the mid to late, I'm looking at Colin here, mid to late 18th century. Uh, and actually, looking at the, the highest prices paid, paid for ceramics such as this, they've all pretty much been from that, that period. Um, and the other uh, strong trend has been in 20th century Chinese works on paper, which have seen, I would have thought, actually more than 500% increase for some of these artists. And two of the main artists, Qi Baishai and Dakian Zhang, are in the top 10 uh, best-selling artists last year in terms of auction turnover, turning over near enough £200 million between them. Um, the ring, showing on the end here, is an extremely rare, fancy, deep blue diamond ring, 5.3 carats, that we sold in 2013 for world record price of £6.2 million. Diamonds uh, and uh, natural pearls, particularly from the uh, early and well, late 19th, early 20th century, have done really well for the last five years. But they're now being outstripped by coloured gemstones, uh, and, uh, such as rubies, emeralds and sapphires. Uh, particularly from old mines like Kashmir. Um, there's a great appreciation for, for these coloured gemstones in the Far East. And per carat, they are now more valuable than diamonds, which is an extraordinary thing. Never happened before. Um, the next big thing, difficult, difficult one to answer, but um, here is an amazing piece. It's, uh, it's, um, I'm going to talk about African art, contemporary African art. And this is... Um, uh, a work by an artist called El Anatsui. He's in his late 70s now. And he is the leading contemporary African artist. Um, this piece actually is about the size of this wall. It's made up of um, bottle tops. It's extraordinary work. Um, and it's quite extraordinary also that you know, the, the, the African contemporary art market has been completely overlooked. Obviously now there's interest, there's huge money uh, going to Nigeria. Uh, El, Anats El Anatsui is based in Nigeria. Um, and over the last three years, uh, the Pompidou, the Met, the Royal Academy have all had shows of his works. And I think we're seeing the, the uh, museums are looking ahead, trying to buy things perhaps cheaply, and his works are going to end up in, 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 in the museums first of all, and the trend will be set from there. Here at Bonhams, we have now started holding Africa Now sales. They're hugely successful, and you can still buy works in the 10 to 100,000 pound mark, including El Natsui, uh, and I guess they could well be a good long-term bet. My last slide, and I'm a furniture man by, by training, uh, and I still love that subject, and it's in an awful, awful press over the last decade or so. Um, and I just wonder, you know, if everyone's got it wrong, because this desk we sold in a, in a, in a big house sale down in Cornwall, Trillisic House, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it came with the receipt from the family who, who, who bought it from Harrods exactly 100 years before, and they bought it for £500. Now, if you put that in the Bank of England inflation calculator, that works at about £51,000. When we sold it 100 years later, we got £58,000. So that shows a little bit of growth on the brown furniture market. And I guess who's to say the next sort of John Paul Getty from China or Paul Mellon might not just see the beautiful craftsmanship of English furniture and start to, to uh, start, start to collect it. Um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, we're happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Harvey, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, after wetting our appetite, maybe I should change the topic and talk about buying art rather than selling it. Uh, but I suppose there may be any number of reasons why you uh, might be looking to sell an artwork. Hopefully it's not the leaking roof and the school fees. Uh, maybe it is that you're looking to upgrade your collection, uh, selling some of these early acquisitions that no longer fit the profile and caliber of your collection. Maybe it is that you uh, regard uh, art just as another investment, looking to take profit. Maybe it is that your children have no interest of any kind in art and you're looking to dispose of your collection during your lifetime rather than pass it uh, on uh, to them. 
Now, whatever the reason, uh, there are a couple of issues which crop up again and again in our daily practice, and that's prompted me to put together a list of top 10 things to bear in mind when selling art. Now, given that I've got now slightly less than 10 minutes uh, left to go through those uh, 10 points, there will be a, a pretty brisk canter, but please come back to any of those during the question and answer session later. So the first point is, is it actually yours to sell? Uh, often artworks are owned jointly by husband and wife. Legal title might reside uh, with the trustees of a family trust, or heaven forbids, your bank might have a security interest in the artwork. And these are also uh, circumstances where the consent or involvement of others is necessary to ensure that the buyer acquires good title. Provenance directly affects value and price. Uh, a complete provenance history provides comfort to the seller and increases the value of an artwork at the point of sale. The buyer or the auction house or other intermediary, if you're selling uh, indirectly, will ask questions to so anticipate their uh, due diligence inquiries, start putting together a file with the ownership exhibition history of the artwork, and if there are any gaps in provenance, start filling them even if at the end of the day it is through an art title insurance product. Obviously, if you're selling through an auction house like Bonhams, they have got experts on hand who can help you with putting the required documentation together. Authenticity. Is it what you think it is? Your artwork does not even need to be an authentic Beltraki forgery. Attribution and academic opinion can change, in particular if you've owned an artwork over a long period of time. The Rembrandt project is an example in point, uh, downgrading uh, several hundred artworks which were previously accepted as being by Rembrandt um, and are no longer regarded as such. On the other hand, sometimes copies get upgraded to originals um, or um, study works to autograph works. If you're selling contemporary art, um, hopefully we'll have a certificate of authenticity from the artist. But pause and take advice before you submit an artwork to an authentication board for assessment. The last thing you want is for it to come back stamped, denied on the back, or even destroyed, as can happen in France. Now, when you're ready to sell, what's the best sales channel? Is it a private sale? Is it an auction sale? Sometimes auction houses are actually uniquely placed to broker a private sale. They know their client base. They know who is in the market for what and can act very effectively in brokering a sale discreetly and quietly out of the public limelight. Obviously, there are other sales channels, there are galleries, dealers, other intermediaries. Where's the best place to sell? Is it London or, or overseas? Is there maybe a preferred market for the artist in issue? Or how does your sale fit into the auction calendar? Price, that's the interesting one. Obviously, if you are selling, you will probably look to maximize your sales proceeds. Therefore, even before you start uh, trying to set a price, see whether there's anything you can do to enhance the value of the artwork. Maybe a light clean restoration, a more appropriate frame. Um, maybe it can be channeled into an exhibition about the artist or merits academic publication. Once you've optimized the potential of the artwork, there's obviously plenty of data out there on the internet about values, about prices. Artnet is a usual starting point, but there are no substitutes for expert appraisals and valuations of the artwork that we're currently looking at, because as we've heard from Harvey, even to say very similar artworks can arrive at very different sales prices. Now, during that process, you'll be faced with lots of numbers, but don't just look at the headline valuation. Bear in mind commission rates and look at what the net return to you is going to be at the end of the day. Contract, the lawyer would say that. Um, open and shut case, have a written contract, full stop. It's your insurance policy. Understand the terms. Both the legal and the art rate are uniquely capable of generating completely incomprehensible language. And even I need to go back and uh, read up uh, regularly what the difference is between School of uh, Van Dyck, Follower of Van Dyck, Sogler Van Dyck, After Van Dyck, um, etc. And that's before you get to the legal terminology. Obtain advice and be prepared to negotiate. Even it says at the top <coughs> standard terms and conditions, you can always try and talk to them. Okay. 
Be aware of the risks of the transaction. Carry out some due diligence. Who are you dealing with? The buyer, is he going to be good for the money? The intermediary, if um, it's not a reputable auction house or somebody you know, um, who are they? We're currently dealing with a client who's short of a canaletto and several million pounds because the uh, agent to whom he entrusted um, the work used it to fund the Ponzi scheme. Before you part possession with your artwork, get a condition report uh, prepared with a detailed photographic record. Transport is the biggest cause of damage and loss to artworks. Understand when the risk of damage and loss passes to the buyer. Ensure that insurance cover is in place and that till that point in time. And at the risk of stating obvious uh, point, don't transfer title until you've got cleared funds from the buyer in your account. Number eight is red tape. The art market is often said to be unregulated, and that's certainly correct compared to things like the financial markets, but there are still rules and regulations that need to be complied with. In particular, if you're starting to move art over international borders, even temporarily. Taxes and duties become payable. Who pays them? Is it the buyer or is it the seller? Ivory is a big topic at the moment. We were recently consulted by a lady from New Zealand who moved a 19th century piano to the UK um, as part of her house move to London. Uh, the piano had ivory keys. And before she knew it, it was seized by customs and excise and threatened with destruction because inadvertently she fell foul of the CITES regulations. And surprisingly, perhaps artist resale right is still a hot topic if the art trade is involved. The next one again is an obvious one, tax, capital gains tax, we've heard the word already, uh, is the key word here. Ideally you will have obtained your tax advice at the point when you bought the artwork that is now for sale and hopefully it is in a tax uh, appropriate structure that uh, helps you uh, mitigate the implications of the sale and the treatment of the sales proceeds for tax purposes. And finally, if you're a trade seller, there's a whole extra layer of consumer protection rules that applies to you. The shocking news is the Van Gogh painting is considered goods for the purpose of the Sale of Goods Act, just in the same way as a can of baked beans or a washing machine. A lot obviously happens these days on the internet, so e-commerce, distant selling are subject to specific rules. And just to keep the lawyers amongst us in business, we now have hot off the press the Consumer Rights Act 2015 which will come into force in October of this year um, and bless us all with a little bit more paperwork yet. Now, all of these uh, are obviously manageable issues if you're alive to them um, and if you obtain advice early. But just in case you decided that you're not going to face all of that and you're just going to give it all away, that's my cue to hand you over to Hattie. Gregor has helpfully talked to you this afternoon about tips on how to sell your art or your chattels if you want to sell them as a way of disposing of chattels. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about giving them all away. Um, you might think that giving away your chattels is the easy option for uh, no tricky contracts to negotiate, no prices or commission even to negotiate. What can go wrong? You just give it away. Surely it's simple. The courts, however, have been frequently asked to determine whether transactions are in fact gifts or loans or neither. Um, what I hope to do this afternoon is talk you through a number of examples to illustrate that it is a grey area and that actually, like many things in law, it's never that simple. So what do you have to do to give something away? Is it always this obvious? If you want to give away your helicopter, your car, your building, your chattels... Do you have to gift wrap them? Is gift wrapping enough? Um, in law, in order to make a gift, you have to do three things. There are three essential ingredients to gift giving. A gift is a gratuitous and voluntary transfer of property from one person to another. But in order to make it a valid gift, there have to be three things. First, intention on part of the donor to give. Second, intention on part of the donee to accept. And third, delivery. And by delivery, they mean passing the gift over. And sometimes it can be physically that, handing it over, as I will go on to explain. So to illustrate the difficulties that you can encounter if you give 
gifts casually, um, I'm going to first of all talk about intention to give, um, citing three examples. The lady on the left is the former partner of the late Jerry Rafferty, who some of you might remember. Um, and she was involved in a court case concerning, amongst other things, three guitars, a Steinway piano, some art and some furniture that she claimed had been given to her by Jerry Rafferty in the months before his death. Um, his executors took a different view and the case went to court. And there was no formal written deed of gift, as you might expect. There was no evidence. There was nothing to suggest that these had been given to her for her to keep post his death. And she lost, and the judge said there is no evidence, formal or informal, of a, of a gift, but there was, in fact, evidence that um, Jerry Rafferty had, before he died, said to his executors that he hadn't made any lifetime gifts, and also that when he did ask for some of his possessions back, it hadn't been raised by his girlfriend at the time, and she didn't say, well, you can't ask them back because you've given them to me. Um, looking at all the circumstantial evidence together, which is all the court can do if they haven't got documentary evidence, they decided on balance, actually, it wasn't a gift, and she lost and was £75,000 worse off in costs. Um, those of you of a certain age might remember the um, lady in the middle, Farrah Fawcett, or Farrah Fawcett Majors, as she was when I was at school. Um, in 1980, she sat for Andy Warhol, and he produced two pictures for her, and this is one of them. One of them she kept, and the other one hung in the um, bedroom of her former partner, Ryan O'Neill, for 17 years. He had it in his Palm Beach house, I think, or wherever it was. But anyway, he had it for 17 years. When she died, they weren't together. They were very much an on-off couple, and they weren't together. And she left all her artwork to the University of Texas to do with as they wished. Um, University of Texas discovered that actually there was a second Warhol portrait and then it was with Ryan O'Neill and again a court case ensued and again there was no documentary evidence but the interesting thing about this case was that um, there was an awful lot of circumstantial evidence I think it took seven days in all to, to determine it so there was lots of evidence of various friends of theirs saying oh she said this or he said that or um, you know she knew that it was hanging there and she didn't want to remove it and it all boiled down to what did the court actually believe at the end of the day? What was the, what was the likely outcome? And given that it had been on his wall for 17 years, they decided it was a gift. But again, no evidence to prove it. Um, the third example, um, what, that is Sir Malcolm Arnold, if, um, if you don't know. But there was a case recently, it was a 2013 case, the facts of which are very complicated, and I won't go in for the purposes of today. But it revolved around 103 manuscripts that he had written and had left, and there were conflicting claims on his estate, both from his long-term carer and his two children. And they said that they had been gifted the manuscripts. Um, one of the issues, which is the only one that's relevant to today, was that in 1976, his son received two chests from his father with a note that said, all the books and sculptures are for you and Catherine to share and keep or sell if you like. Um, and therefore they said, well, that's evidence of a gift to us. There was a note that accompanied it. It was intended to be a gift to us. There was delivery because the chests arrived. We have the, we have the manuscripts. Um, please accept it's a gift. And at first instance, the court didn't, and there were difficulties, and it went to the Court of Appeal. Um, and the Court of Appeal found that, amongst the many other issues they had to determine on that day, they found that actually... Um, too much emphasis in the earlier court had been placed on the intention of the donee and what they felt um, the note meant and not enough had been um, placed on the, on the intention of the donor. And that's what's relevant. It's what did they mean? What did they intend? Did they intend to give it away? Did they intend to lend it? Was it meant to stay with that person? So, just summing up. Um, in order to give property away, obviously you must have capacity, not a child, not mentally incapable. Um, there is a case where, I thought I'd mention it only because it's an unusual one, where somebody tried to give um, a donation to the BNP, but they lived in Spain and their executive said, no, he can't because he hasn't been on the electoral register for the last five years, so he didn't have a right to vote. So you must have capacity, obviously free from undue influence. A present gift of a future interest is valid, so you can give away today something that you know will fall in in the future. But a current promise to make a gift in the future is not valid, and it's not valid because of lack of consideration and also delivery, which I'll come on to in a moment. 
Intention to accept, you won't be surprised to know there's not much case law on this. Not many people rush to the courts and say, no, no, I, don't, you, I, I didn't intend to accept this view. Um, but there are two things. There must be an absence of rejection by the donee or the gift is invalid. And the donee can't change their mind afterwards. So if you're offered the Bentley and you say, I can't afford to run it, and therefore, no, thank you, and then a week later you think, well, actually, I should take it, it has to be re-offered to you to be accepted. Delivery. This is the interesting one, which causes a lot of um, interesting case law. You might recognise the top right-hand corner, Dylan Thomas. I think this is one of my favourite cases. In 1966... Dylan Thomas, whilst drinking in the public houses of Soho, managed to lose the original manuscript of Under Milkwood. Um, he was flying to America a few days later, and he'd fortunately made some copies of it. And at Victoria train station, he gave the copies to a BBC producer and said, here are the copies. He was flying off to New York, sadly his last journey, because he died while he was there. Um, but here are the copies. And I'm, I, I don't know where it is, but it's in one of these three or four pubs. If you find it, you can keep it. Needless to say, the producer did trawl all the pubs of Soho and did find it and kept it. And when Dylan Thomas then died, his widow sued for it back and said it wasn't a gift. And the issue determined on whether or not there was effective delivery because he hadn't actually placed it in his hands. He said, if you find it, it's yours. Um, the court looked at all the evidence again. Um, they decided on balance that it was a gift. But they said in this case, um, the producer acted as his personal representative and Dylan Thomas had told him where it was. He told him where to go to find it and therefore there was effective delivery so he could keep it. Um, the picture of the furniture goes back to a, a case where a husband put his, eyes, uh, put his hands over his wife's eyes and took her into the matrimonial home on the first day and did the ta-da moment and said, all the furniture you can see is yours to keep. Fifteen years later, after they both lived there together, there was a bit of a dispute about that. And um, actually, it arose in the context of bankruptcy, and I think the court sniffed a, sniffed a rat because the husband said, oh, no, the trustees in bankruptcy can't take the furniture because it all belongs to my wife. Um, and they said, no, no, because it wasn't delivered to her. Um, it's been criticised later because you have to say to yourself, well, what more could he have done apart from pick up every stick of furniture and put it in her hand? Um, but they said, no, no, it was co-owned and it wasn't hers exclusively and it's not delivery. So there were problems. Um, there is a later case about a piano and a father who bought it for his three daughters and said to one of them, you're the pianist in the family, you're the expert, the piano's yours. Um, but again, because it was shared, because there was no sort of uniqueness of ownership, delivery didn't take place. Um, and the final example is, um, again, another case I like, it's quite an old one where a father had said to his son all the time, all the port in the cellar will be yours. It's not ready yet, but it will be yours. And he kept it throughout his life, and the court said, no, nope, sorry, you've had possession, it's like retaining a life interest. If you actually want to give your property away and um, you have delivery, then you must surrender control of the goods if they're in your possession. Um, so delivery is tricky, so you have to have the three elements. You must have all three in order to have an effective gift, and don't assume that because you've just said something to somebody, as we all might casually do, that one's for you, this is for you, that you've actually made a valid gift because you probably haven't. Um, so own or loan, sorry, carrying on, delivery words, um, obviously Dylan Thomas, if you find it, it's yours. If an item is huge, if you're delivering a car or a house or something, you can do constructive delivery, you can give the keys to a vehicle, keys to a property because they can't have it. Um, an undivided share of gift, which is also what I've mentioned in relation to the furniture. Um, own or loan. A loan is a different category altogether. It's a transfer of possession of goods, but not the title to them for gratuitous or mutual benefit. Um, I've given an attribution there to Palmer on Bailment, which is the seminal text on this. Um, Loans often take the form of a contract called bailment, which is a legal principle, but basically it's a very common contract that we all enter into. You take your dry cleaning to your dry cleaners, they have possession, you retain legal ownership, but they have physical possession of it. What's the relationship between you? It's one of bailor and bailee. Um, it's a whole subject in itself, so I won't go into it, but it is an interesting one because often people think that they have ownership and that possession of the goods gives them title, and it doesn't. Um, this is a, a case that I like because it can demonstrate 
the real need for documentary evidence and the distinction being blurred between gifts and loans. This was a case where, in nine, sometime between 1955 and 61, the owner of a 1928 Levis, I think I pronounced that right, motorcycle, responded to an appeal from the, from the Museum of York to have vintage motorcycles to exhibit in one of their garages, their in Edwardian garage. He dropped it off one night with a note to reception saying what he'd done, here it is, um, nothing happened. In 1992, so a significant period of time had elapsed, he went back and realised that actually his prized motorcycle had never been used in the exhibition at all. Um, and so he asked for it back and he said, it was a loan. I gave it to you on the condition that you were going to exhibit it. You didn't exhibit it. Can I have it back? And the museum said, no, because it was a gift. Um, and again, it went to court, um, unreported. But um, the point there was that there was no evidence, and the court said that you couldn't have revoked the gift for failure of making the condition valid because you didn't know that the museum would have accepted it if there was a condition anyway. Um, so it, it just sort of is an illustration, really, of the, the blurred lines that can exist when you're trying to um, give things away or, or not give them away, as the case may be. John Thomas Baines. John Thomas Baines was... Um, a cabinet maker who became an ornamental sign maker who then became a portraitist and he wanted to travel the world so he went on board ships and he painted scenes from the um, regions that he'd been to. He actually went on um, the Livingstone Zambezi trip and has a, a wonderful body of work but Kings Lynn, which is where he's from, retained ownership of them and in 1947 47, they sent a lot of his paintings to then southern Rhodesia on loan. Um, I believe that they're still trying to get them back, but they now are saying, well, it wasn't a, a loan, it was a permanent loan, which of course is an oxymoron. It's either a gift or it's a loan, either you have it back or you don't have it back. So in this case, you have to look at, well, what were the terms on which it was sent over to Rhodesia? Was it meant to be a gift? What was the intention when it went across? What documentary evidence do we have? How can we prove that it was a loan? If they say, well, we restored all the paintings and you didn't tell us not to, is that enough to show that your conduct has um, made them think that it is actually a gift rather than a loan? You've acted unilaterally in relation to some property and um, nobody's contradicted you. So they had to look at all the sorts of um, surrounding circumstantial evidence. But that is because we go back to the basic... Um, principles of there not being any documentary evidence that clearly defines it um, and you have to look at the intention of the donor. Um, I've just quickly highlighted here some of the um, things that you ought to be aware of, some of which overlap slightly with, with Gregor. But who's got title? Can they demand return? You look if you haven't got any evidence of the statements made, discussions, um, circumstantial evidence, the purpose of the transfer, was it transferred to be exhibited in a museum, to be exhibited as a motorcycle museum or not? You look at the conduct of the parties. Um, did they acquiesce or fail to take steps if the property that you say is yours and that was not um, a gift that was a loan was dealt with in a particular way? Um, you would think that if it was your property and you find, you find out that they've sent it on loan somewhere that actually you might have piped up and said, hang on a minute, you can't do that, it belongs to me. Um, so all these things must be taken into account. I'm going to end on a, a recent case, because it was only decided last month, um, which is a, an interesting one, and it was all about, is this a gift or is it a loan? Um, it um, involved four Lancia Stratus cars, all from the 70s, and it was an unfortunate dispute, really, because it was between a father and son. Um, and the father owned the cars and had another car collection, but he lent them to his son to further his son's career as a car designer. And he, he was quite open about the fact that he lent them frequently. He allowed people to believe that they belonged to his son. They were displayed at various exhibitions as the son's property, and the father allowed that to happen because it was furthering his son's career. Um, and he also accepted that the cars would pass to his son um, at some point in the future. So they were, you know, used frequently by his son, but he never said that they were given to him as a gift. Sadly, the relationship between father and son soured, and the son decided to take action, and he brought all the cars and shipped them over to the UK and put them in a garage. Um, needless to say, worldwide freezing orders, cars injuncted, legal proceedings started, all very sad, really, when it's father and son. Um, but the court 
took a very factual approach and said, well, you know, where is the documentary evidence going back to the central point? And they looked at not just the course of conduct, because there was an awful lot of evidence about, yes, but he said this, and it was exhibited here in my name. He said, where is, you know, is there anything else? So they went back over emails between the two, going back quite a few years, and there was a series of emails which, in which the son accepted that he didn't own the cars and thanked his father for lending them to him. And this post-dated the date at which the son said he'd been given them. And so the court felt, well, actually, um, it was never intended to be a gift. It was always a pretense gift for, for the son's sake of his son's career. Um, but actually, it was a loan. Um, so I think that sort of sums up. I think the moral of the story, really is that it isn't that straightforward and things change. I think the point is that things change. Relationships change in families. Values change, values go up. Um, what might have been a, a fairly um, casual arrangement years ago or a, you know, jotting down on a note, here it is, it's for you at a later date, can cause problems at a later date if it's scrutinised and it doesn't stand up. And often that doesn't happen, but it often does if, um, as I say, relationships or values change. Um, so I'm happy to take questions on that later, but thank you very much. I'm now going to pass over to Mark. Transitioning art to the next generation. So on the idea of, uh, to paraphrase a, a Swiss watch company's strap line that they quite often use, uh, they say you never actually own your artwork, you merely look after it for the next generation. And on that theme, I thought we'd uh, try and talk about how you can maintain these things. Now, luckily, a lot of the items uh, that we get to handle have been rejected by the next generation uh, as being far too old-fashioned, and uh, family items come to market and then can be enjoyed by others. Uh, but for works that have a family history or a resonance beyond the monetary, there are a couple of tax-efficient ways that you can retain single works or larger collections. The first uh, thing that we could look at is the, a gift and leaseback arrangement. Now, picking up on what Hetty said about the gift idea, uh, the Finance Act of 1986 introduced into an inheritance tax regime the provision where the donor could reserve possession and enjoyment of the gifted property during the seven years prior to his death, referred to as a gift with reservation. So long as the donor had afforded full consideration in money or money's worth for the reserved benefits. In other words, a parent or couple of advanced years are able to gift their chattels or a selection of their chattels, um, typically to one or more of their children, while still enjoying having them in their house. So it seems like they've got their cake and eating it. Uh, one of the great advantages of this scheme is that um, there's no quality or category hurdle to jump through, and I'll talk about another hurdle which is much more onerous. But by that I mean you can have really quite modest furniture, for instance. Uh, a couple of pieces up there, uh, pieces that are family owned, um, there's no drawback to including them. Uh, similarly with, with pictures on the wall, uh, nothing is outside the scope of this scheme. So how does it work? The practical considerations are this. One needs as the donor to recruit a suitably experienced lawyer. Who can I think of? Uh, possibly uh, hunters would do for that uh, particular aspect. Um, and they need to draw up a deed of gift and draft a lease arrangement. One then needs to find a suitable firm of valuers. Again, we are probably in the right sort of company for that. And thirdly, to find an advisor to act in the negotiation for the donee. Um, again, we have managed to find a, a suitable partner who can assist with that. In fact, one of them sitting in the room today. Um, once items have been chosen and the market valuation completed, the next step is for, for the advisors, one for the donor, one for the donee, to agree on values and attributions. And unless the values are particularly high or specialist, um, it's not normally necessary to have two separate valuations. Then what happens is the all-important arm's length negotiation. Now this is all important because as far as HMRC are concerned, they need to be satisfied that both parties have negotiated the level of rent. It is this level of rent that is the most intriguing aspect of this scheme. 
On the one hand, it's a perfectly valid argument to say that these items of furniture and unfashionable pictures that hang on parents' walls effectively have no rentable value. Uh, conversely, one could argue that this frink bronze here, that similarly could be part of a gift and leaseback arrangement, there are galleries that, in London particularly, that exist where you could go out and for a suitable rent, you could, um, you could rent that for a set period of time, with lots of conditions obviously attached. But in terms of the, the uh, other items, such as desks and clocks, I'm not aware, and no one has come up with a convincing case, that there really is a rental market for this. However, the HMRC are not happy with uh, what uh, is going on, and they are, are sort of keen that a 5 to 10% level of, of rental is, is agreed, and that sort of goes along in line with property and land, and if you lease your boats or your planes or, or other assets, why should art be any different? Uh, and it is a most unusual convention that has been arrived at. I mean, I think it's probably unique that it has no basis in anything other than a convention, and it's sort of lost in the midst of time, that a 1% rental charge is what is generally agreed. Now, considering such, considerations such as insurance and conservation costs can be added, loaded onto the donor, HMRC are looking into this convention, and I was sitting around a round table with the um, chattels people of the HMRC, and they came up with a proposal that they're going to go away and look at the rental market for chattels again. And some wisecrack came up and said, well, if you find no evidence that there's a rental market, will you then agree that the rate can be zero? Now, I suspect that's not going to happen, and they'll, they'll come up, they'll find no real suitable market and it'll stick at 1%. Uh, but there is always that risk that it could go up. Uh, there are of course a few other points to bear in mind. Uh, the need for a rent review, an update of market values after five years, um, and important that all negotiations are suitably recorded. And although there's no obstacle to the type of work, as you can see, um, anything is, can be in the frame for this. Uh, there are obviously some costs involved, so you, the, the item or collection needs to be of sufficient value to bear the costs of the valuations and the, and the lawyer's fees and, and, and all the rest of it. So, um, there, but apart from that, it's a, it's a very effective scheme. Um, there is one other scheme that we could think about in terms of transitioning art to the, to the next generation. And that is the concept of conditional exemption. Now, I'm sure all of you are, are very familiar with this, but if I can just run through how this works, is um, this is an area where obviously specialist advice should be taken um, because what's happened now, well, in the last 10 years or so, is that the conditions under which the exemption is made are fairly onerous um, and they're not to be taken out without careful planning. So how does it work? So at the point of, uh, normally, uh, um, after a, a death, an executor would seek um, to have something conditionally exempted from inheritance tax. And the first thing to consider is, is it preeminent? Now, an object or group of objects needs to be of preeminent quality. Uh, although this is not defined um, by Arts Council England, um, it does have some guidelines, and just to run through these quickly, they are, does an object have an especially close association with our history or national life? Is the object of a special artistic or art historical interest? Is the object of a special importance of a study of some particular form of art? Uh, or does the object have an especially close association with a particular historic setting? So looking at the rather wonderful sofa that we sold uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this isn't a conditionally exempt item. That wouldn't be appropriate for me to show you those photos of those particular things. But this is something that I think I'd be most surprised if this didn't succeed through the Arts Council panel, um, in that this is an 18th century sofa, um, and it was being sold by the people who still owned the house for which it had been made. So 
the the second um, sorry the, so the last uh, condition especially close association with a particularly historic setting well it obviously fulfills that um, it's a particularly fine example and so I think that would have a fairly strong case of being conditionally exempt but if it does pass that test there are some fairly onerous uh, conditions that associated with it so no IHT to pay however uh, access arrangements uh, that HMRC are increasingly vigorous to police require, um, and perhaps people who in the audience will, will know the precise terms of this better than me, but um, access periods of at least 20 days, and um, some can be more, more onerous than that. Uh, reasonable access has to be granted at any time, I believe. Um, and photographs are given when requested. Um, another piece that uh, could be considered, I, I would have thought, is this wonderful Watts painting. This is, again, not an actual conditionally exempt item. Uh, this is something that's coming up again in a, in a future sale. But I think a strong case could be made that that was um, a particularly outstanding um, work of art. And if it was uh, to be conditionally exempted, I would have thought it would have stood a fairly good chance um, if suitably, if the estate was suitably advised, etc. Um, it should also be noted that there are some fairly painful penalties to be taken if the conditions aren't met. So IHT hasn't been paid, uh, conditions are set in place. However, if these conditions are broken, um, the, the HMRC reserve the right to actually uh, say, well, you're, you haven't... Uh, followed up with your undertakings and now your full tax liability um, is going to come into the fore. Um, but it, what's quite interesting I think is that um, as a postscript to the conditional exemption if you go onto the Arts Council website at the moment there is a fairly long list of items that are being sold. Now part of the stipulation is that the Arts Council insists that if a condition exempt item is coming up for sale, it is placed on their register. And you can see there a fair number of items where the family have decided that it really isn't going to be very appropriate to keep it under these conditions any longer. Um, so it's not necessarily always the case. And I think uh, possibly a, a couple of other things, uh, slightly left field, but a, a couple of other ways that you might think about um, transitioning art um, is the increasingly popular area of prenuptial agreements and where particularly on a, a second marriage or, or even a first specific family works are ring fenced in a prenuptial agreement so they're not part of the assets of the married couple and I suppose traditionally uh, many families use trust to safeguard against sales and limit tax liabilities. But trust, I suspect, is a whole new seminar, and I've got a lot of people here who are, know a great deal more about discretionary trust than I would pretend to know. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that the idea of placing things in trust now is less popular than it was because of the 10-year charge and other um, tax regimes associated with it. So that really comes to my conclusion. So thank you very much indeed. I'm now handing over to Colin.